Hello and welcome to the Penguin Prof channel. I'm Valerie Pennington. We're going to talk about making slides that don't suck for your Zoom classes and instructional videos. I want to talk about things to avoid and then go through four steps to make great slides for a great show. And then I'm going to finish with a demo editing slides from a publisher. Showing slides in this kind of environment is really different than a face-to-face -face class, right? Attention spans are much lower. You often have very limited limited real estate if your students are watching on phones, and there are so many more distractions. I want to start with some things to avoid slide overload. This is a big one. People try and cram everything onto these slides. I have to admit this one was fun to make, but too much text is really a common problem. This video on YouTube was 53 minutes. Yeah. Please don't squeeze or stretch your penguins. Don't give us links that no one can click. That's really irritating. Visuals that no one can see. So this presenter kept saying in his video, he knew that the viewers probably couldn't see the screen, but, and he was really sorry. Don't apologize. If you think that something will be hard to see or understand, then why are you using it? You should avoid crazy and distracting backgrounds and really slow slide progression. This is really different than a face-to-face -face class. Showing the same slide with all this text, people read it very, very quickly, and then the longer the slide stays up, the more people start to be distracted and checking their phones. Have you noticed uh, this slide has been up for way too long? Let's talk about steps for a great presentation. There are four, and I'm really only gonna talk about two, three, and four. The first one, writing an outline. You're an educator, you, you probably already have your tools for this. I personally use Notability on an iPad, but use whatever you like. Getting content into slides, you're gonna pick what kind of slide deck you wanna use, what kind of software, pick a template, and then we'll talk about fonts and colors quite a bit. Templates are very personal choices. They can be very discipline specific also. I just recommend clean and consistent templates. Also make sure you pay attention to that aspect ratio because you're going to want to use a 16 by nine aspect ratio for standard video. Next, you're going to go through your outline and determine your main points. And those should be text usually. So I like to have my notability notes on my computer right next to my keynote slides. And I start to bring that text over, which brings us to fonts. And it is easy to get carried away here. The main distinction in fonts is serif or sans serif. So either with or without those extra, what they used to be, of course, brush strokes. They look like little feet sometimes. This really gives fonts their character, so it's a very personal decision. More traditional fonts have those extra little brush strokes. Modern and especially digital fonts tend not to, but it really is your choice. So here are some clean sans serif fonts for video and some serif fonts. Something to keep in mind, size does matter. You want to use a size that is as large as possible given the other things you have going on in your slide. So if you have not gone down this rabbit hole yet, go and check out Google Fonts. It's really cool. You can enter in custom text and then filter the fonts based on lots and lots of different properties. So check those out. Let's talk about colors and contrasts. I'm going to have a lot of resources down below, but here is a color picker. And this will allow you to pick colors and identify colors. Hex codes are probably the most common way to identify color. And you're going to want to check out webaim.org, web accessibility in mind, and start checking contrasts. There are standards for contrast established by the World Wide Web Consortium. If you teach in a public institution, you have to abide by these rules. Contrast ratio has to do with perceived luminance or brightness between between two colors, and it's expressed as a ratio, with the low end being one to one, white on white, for example, which you cannot read, 21 to one is the maximum. So the minimum allowed contrast for text and images of text is 4.5 to one. It goes down a little bit if you're gonna use larger fonts. Pure red on white has a ratio of four to one. Pure green on white has a ratio of 1.4 to one and pure blue on white has a ratio of 8.6 to one. So the maximum, like I said, is 21 to one. That's of course my personal favorite because uh, penguins. 
black on white or white on black is the easiest to read. And if you look, it doesn't matter which one you pick as the foreground or the background, right? It's a contrast ratio. So this contrast checker is really powerful and it will tell you whether or not the colors you've picked pass those minimum standards for normal or large text. That blue color is a pass, 8.59 to 1. Here is a gray on white. You can see what it looks like and it tells you, no, that's not enough contrast. This is an example of the minimum contrast. Why would you use minimum contrast though? I mean, more contrast is always better. Do you remember this that I showed you in the beginning? So yeah, I went and grabbed those colors and checked the contrast and uh, that, that is an epic fail. How did I do that though? There are a lot of tools to pick colors from the web and this one is a Chrome extension and it's called Eyedropper and it's very cool. And when you install it, you just click it and then you can pick colors from your web page. So I'm gonna click this color. I wanna, I wanna get the hex code for this color. So click the eyedropper a second time and you notice it gives you all the data, including the hex code that you can now copy and paste. So I go back into my contrast checker and I can paste in that hex code and voila, there it is. So now I know that not only, yes, I, I like that color, but it passes those minimum standards for contrast. Another thing to keep in mind when choosing color is that one in 12 men and one in 200 women have some form of color blindness. And we're not going into the anatomy and physiology of this right now, but there are lots of different types of color blindness. So it is important when you're making content not to rely on color alone to convey information. So this wouldn't work for a person with red green color blindness. Go ahead and double it up. If you're going to use color, also use maybe symbols and that way a colorblind person would also get all the information that they need. I'm not saying don't use color. I'm saying use color intentionally and make sure it's not the only source of information. One more thing. Oh, I like to use color. I use color very intentionally. So you'll notice all of my pro tips will look like that. Um, will you be presenting live with a webcam video? Because when you place content on your slides, you need to keep that in mind. So if I were going to be using a live webcam, I would move my text and content above so that I'm not blocking my own content. All right, step three, images and transitions. I like to keep everything simple and clear, especially for Zoom. Don't make your transitions too complicated and give them meaning. So I use doorway for big introductions. I'll use push or sometimes grid to introduce new topics. And most of the slides I just use dissolve. As far as images go, keep in mind, again, all design choices should be in service to your content and real estate might be very, very small. Images and text versus text alone. I don't know, you be the judge. So here's some information about mitochondria in a presentation on video or in Zoom. I just don't think this is very effective compared to here's what a mitochondrion looks like and here's what it does. So food and oxygen goes in, the mitochondrion transforms that energy and you get the idea. This is the same information, but expressed graphically. And images are very powerful. They elicit emotional responses. And we know that that is linked to improved memory. This is Flops the Penguin, and he always shows up when things get tough. So my students actually now know that when things get difficult, just add flops. If you are looking for free and diverse images, the online network of educators has this great resource page, I'll link it below, where you can find images of just about everything that you're looking for. Step four, we're gonna talk about pacing and timing. And by the way, have you noticed the navigation box that helps viewers to keep track of where you are? Never give away too much too soon. So what I like to do is a slow reveal. I've been doing it throughout this presentation. So I will insert a shape. Normally it won't have a border. This is just so you can see it. And then I resize the shape to reveal the points as I talk about them and I finished with the completed slide. Now you can of course use animation tools, but often you want to do this with data and images also, and you'll need shapes for that. So here, if I show this, I just gave away everything. So it's much more effective if I cover up the data and then I can 
ask students about it. We can talk about it if it's a Zoom class. I get them to think and talk, and then I reveal the relationship. So it's much more dynamic this way. Finally, I want to start with publisher slides, which faculty will often use as a starting point, and we're going to make some tweaks to change them so they work better for Zoom or a video. So this is what the publisher gives us. And I'm just going to scroll through all of it. Can you imagine just reading these in a video? It's very, very common to do that. And this is the image that they provide. So there's some good things. It's a good font and there's good contrast. I checked it. The font size is a bit small, I would say, especially the body text is only 40. And part of the problem is that the slide doesn't take advantage of this 16 by 9 aspect ratio. We've got slide after slide with just text. The language isn't so great. It's very, very dry. And this image is just too complex and it's gonna be impossible to read on a small device. It's designed to be projected in a classroom like this. So with minimal editing, but keeping the content the same, this is what I'm doing. I'm just taking that image and enlarging the portion that we're talking about so I can pull out the segments of the image that are relevant for this content. I also took advantage of the real estate of the slide in this 16 by 9 format. So you've got the original on top, and then I turned that into two slides on the bottom. So that's, that's at least a step in the right direction. Now how I would edit this for a video or a Zoom session, I would take it several steps further. Start with that image. I want to really clean it up, not just enlarge it, but get rid of the stuff that I'm not talking about right away. I use Snagit for that, and if you've never used Snagit, it's by TechSmith. I'll leave links and my video below. It's fantastic. So now I've got this, and now I'm going to clean up and make that language more clear, the glomerulus. Filtrate is produced in the renal corpuscle. Two questions immediately. What's the renal corpuscle? Okay, I answer that right away. And what is filtrate? Okay, filtrate is blood plasma, but without plasma proteins. It's plasma that has been filtered. That's why we call it filtrate. So their text didn't say that, but that's kind of the most important point. And then you have another question immediately. Well, where do the proteins go? So immediately I'm gonna launch into some question and answer if it's a live Zoom class. If it's a video, I'm going to just immediately go into an analogy, something that everyone has done. Everyone watching this has made pasta. So why doesn't the pasta go through the holes of the strainer? So this is a lot more either interactive in a live class or it's relatable if it's a video. In summary, don't ever forget everything is in service to your content. Be consistent and be straightforward. That's usually going to be the win. Design your slides with accessibility in mind. Look at them on your phone to see what they look like on a small screen. If you want to see how I make my YouTube tutorials from start to finish, I'll link that video here. And as always, thank you so much for watching the Penguin Prof channel. For more videos like this, check out my EdTech playlist, and I'll see you in the next one. Good luck.